So hi and welcome to this tutorial on the Bach Fantasia in C minor. Um, beautiful piece. I absolutely adore this piece. I was so happy when I saw this in the list because I'd already had a very short attempt at learning it in the past. Um, I heard Dim Demidenko play this on the Hyperion CD um, and it's a sort of a, a, it's an interesting piece with kind of an interesting history. On the CD that I heard this on, it was actually a CD of Bach transcriptions. And although this isn't really a transcription, um, Busoni, the Italian composer, actually made his own kind of edition of this uh, Fantasia together with the fugue that follows it and added an extra transcription in the middle. And this was, I think, um, something from either of the one of the unaccompanied violin sonatas um, or one of the unaccompanied violin partitas, and it was, it's really lovely. Um, but what particularly interested me as well was the fugue. The fugue is crazy, it's insane. It's like so modern, it's like um, um, very alien sounding almost. It's so highly chromatic. Really interesting fugue, it's like off this planet. And um, in the um, in the only autograph that, that uh, I think people have of, of it. The, the, the fugue is unfinished, um, which is kind of interesting because I'm sort of thinking, no wonder it's unfinished. He must have been looking at it going, what on earth, where am I going with this? It's just nuts. Anyway, so this um, actual Fantasia is really, uh, or Fantasia or however you want to pronounce this thing. I'm going to call it Fantasia. It could be Fantasia. Um, so really, really interesting piece because um, um, Bach in his own lifetime apparently was kind of considered to be a little bit old-fashioned in that he didn't really keep up with the latest fashions of, of what was hot and new, you know, in his, in his time. And this piece here is sort of one of the most um, forward-looking pieces of his. It's sort of a lot of people think it sounds like one of his sons, C.P. Bach. And, and if you've not gone and listened to a lot of C.P. Bach, do go and listen to it. Particularly the CD by Pletniov is just absolutely incredible. Um, so, um, you know, the C.P. Bach style, it's very fresh, it's very youthful. And, and, um, and J.S. Bach, um, it's sort of very highly contrapuntal, very worshipful. He was, you know, very big into religion and God, and it's all very sort of pious and reflective and deep and uh, C.P. Bach is all very showy and in the, in the new style which was frilly and fast and exciting and so this piece here not normal Bach this is exciting sort of useful uh, energetic music now before I go any further I, I really must emphasize that that when we're looking at music like this that it, it's not I, th I think a lot of people feel that like J.S. Bach, his music, has been handed down to us on stone tablets. Like this is a holy relic and we, we have to go, we must play authentically, we must follow the, exactly what he wanted. And, and really music, it just is not like this. Um, you, you bring your own taste to it. You, you kind of figure out what you want to do with it. It's not written in stone. So, you know, there are a lot of different ways of playing this. and. Um, and, you know, um, if I'm teaching this to my students, I don't say, this is how you play it. Uh, I try and figure out, well, what do you want to do with this? What's, what do you feel? Now, I can sort of share my own preferences, um, but that's not how you have to do it. And I've got to admit that, um, oh, by the way, when I was learning this before, um, the reason why I never finished learning it, I spent so long working out the fingerings to, to the fugue, and Bissoni finished the fugue in his, in his version. So um, I had, I had I'd spent hours and hours and hours writing down fingerings, methodically going through it, marking stuff in the score, and I left the score overnight at one of the schools where I teach. And when I came back, it had gone, someone had taken it, and I was so disheartened, I just did not want to sit down and work out all those fingerings from scratch. And so it remained unfinished, I, I didn't really finish learning it. So I was quite happy to sort of look at this and go, yeah, let, let's have another look at this um, Fantasia. Um, anyway, so um, 
Yeah, there's a lot of different ways to play this. And so the version that I first listened to by Nikolai Demidenko, amazing pianist, uh, saw him live about a year ago. He's absolutely superb. And he just plays this at breakneck speed. I mean, he's fast. <laughs> goes on and on like that he is he maybe even a little faster than that he, and, and it's amazing you know it's so good um and his Bach is just incredible um um I've seen on on YouTube oh excuse me I've got something in my eye contact lens issue uh yeah okay so yeah so uh Demidenko has quite a few videos on YouTube where he's playing pieces from the well-tempered clavier. And, you know, what's interesting about them is they are incredible renditions of, of preludes and fugues. And they tend to be on the fast side. And when you look at the comments, the comments generally say something in between, oh my God, that is too fast, that's horrible, to wow, that's really fast, but it's amazing and it works really well. And it divides people. Not everyone likes the way that he plays it. I love it. And, and um, you know, what some people say as well in, in the comments, not, not that you should really give that much uh, credibility to YouTube comments, but, you know, some people do say, um, yeah, it's really on the fast side, but he's still very, very clear with it. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, anyway, so, you know, I, I like his speed with this. And also, personally, I would sort of argue that that kind of speed suits this very fresh, what was for Bach, J.S. Bach, a, a very contemporary, fresh, exciting style. I think, I think it suits it. Now, um, you know, having said that, there's, there's all kinds of different ways of playing it. You know, you can play it slowly, you can go... Um, I think it's a little on the slow side, but you know, you can. Um, the, I prefer it staccato. I prefer... Um, um, by the way, it's been a couple of weeks since I recorded this, so it's not very fresh in my fingers. Um, now, the teaching notes. Um, so there's teaching notes here um, for all of these pieces. This is an absolute load of nonsense, everything it sa says about this piece. I have so many issues with this. So it says, although the piece should not be played staccato, it's like, what? You, you know, like some of my favorite recordings of this are played staccato. That, that's absolute nonsense. What I actually don't like is when a lot of Bach is played hyper legato. It just sends me to sleep. It's so dull. So, you know, there will be people who go... so boring it's it's Bach played legato that made me think for all of my childhood and teenage years that I just didn't like Bach because I just don't like Bach legato um even a bit faster it's so boring <laughs> whereas kind of more interesting and you know when I started to like Bach was when I started to listen to Glenn Gould and Glenn Gould's playing is very very staccato so anyway nonsense that plus and what I recommend is every anyone who learns this must download from IMSLP they must download um, Busoni's edition of this because it's it's got so many ideas for this and so many kind of expressive ideas and ways that he's rewritten this out that makes it much easier to read. Now you also need to be a little bit careful because he has actually changed a lot of notes and changed a lot of sort of ornamentation so you have to be a little bit careful with it. Um, for example, um, there is one bit in bar eight that I do agree with Busoni, it just doesn't work for me. Incidentally, it was a little bit annoying for me to, to relearn this because I had the Busoni version under my fingers, which meant I had to relearn certain bars. But so, so from bar seven, what if we, uh, what's going on from bar seven? Uh, okay. And then in the, in the Bach version, version, we've got... So... And this 
sounds weird, and it sounds weird because Busoni rewrote it, um, and he rewrote it um, to go, um, which I think suits it much much better. So so like the the pattern from bar five. Um, sorry. Um, And then instead of this, Busoni just puts in, which makes so much more sense. Um, but I wouldn't change it <laughs> in a grade eight exam. They're gonna raise an eyebrow and go, "What are you doing? That's not what's written in the bar." Um, but um, I, I think Busoni improved it in, in many ways. But but for the most part, he's kept to the notes that that Bach has. He adds extra octaves, which again, I don't recommend doing this for your grade eight exam, but he does do things like, he writes in, in the beginning. Now in the beginning, it's pretty much as, as Bach wrote. It's just, um, there's no expression markings and all that kind of stuff. Busoni writes in non legato, i.e. play it staccato, and marcato e robusto, uh, my uh, Latin, Italian, Italian, Latin, not Latin. My Italian is horrible, so apologies to people who are who are Italian. But basically, very marked, robust, non legato, staccato. So you know this kind of feel to it. Um, I like the um, Busoni's um, idea of, of what he wants there. He also writes in dynamics, which might help you, you know, uh, decide what to put. Um, so, you know, there's um, a lot of people who I've seen who play this, who play in a very romantic... Uh, what is it? Um, you know... It's like, oh my god, I, I am exaggerating a bit here. But no, to me, this just needs to be tak ta tak ta tak ta ta So it's a little bit rusty, but rather than um, now you can play it that way if you must, if you're convincing with it. But there's an extra thing now. Um, there are a lot of different ways that you can do this. It's not a holy relic. It's not you know on on um, written on stone, carved in stone. Um, but there are things that you can do with this that will raise eyebrows. In the way that um, this this is very much um, in sort of yesterday's news, I saw that Donald Trump is in the news because he was referring to the country Thailand and he called it Thailand <laughs> because it's spelled T H and he and he said Thailand <laughs> and it's like that's just not what you do. That's just not what you call it. Now there's certain things that you can do that that will have some examiners go. That's not what you do. Now, really, these things shouldn't matter, but they kind of do matter because, because it's just not what you do. Um, so one of these is to do with ornaments and to do with trills. So um, uh, if you take the trill at the end of bar one, so, um, um, so this, um, so now this, um, uh, yeah, and, and in other places. I'll, I'll find one in another place soon, but because it's going to be a bit harder to tell there. But basically, a trill um, must come from above, and it must start on the beat, not before the beat. So if you go um, one, two, three, four, not four. That's, that's just not what it does. It's one, two, three, four. So, so the, the trills are on the beat. They start on the beat and they must come from the notes above. Um, because there are people doing slightly weird things with, with this um, that, that I've heard online. Um, so where, where do we have a trill that actually lines up with something in the left hand? Um, because that's where it's going to be most of well, well, let's take the mordants as well. So, so the mordants are 
So what some people are doing, oh my God, don't do this, do not do this, is please don't do that, please don't go. It's, 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 it, it must happen on the B with the right hand. It happens with the right hand. So blah de blah de blah de blah. Um, right, so, so for example, the one in bar five, quite tricky, and I do actually cheat on this. If you look in the Synthesia version I've recorded, I kind of cheat, and I sort of wish I hadn't cheated and spent a bit, a bit more time looking at this. But if we go from bar five, um, and then, so, now it's not, um, it, it, any trill, any sort of modern, must come from the note above, da, 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 and it must come on the B. Um, we know this because of countless, countless people who have said this is how it's done in Baroque times. Now, it used to be that um, up until, I don't know, let's say 30 years ago or something like that, for about 100 years, it had been the fashion to do trills differently, that you start on the note and you kind of with ornaments, you you kind of come from the beat before, but we but we know that's not what you do. That's not how you play it. Um, so, for example, Graham Fitch, who is like a, a, a well known UK pedagogue and teacher, who was involved, I believe, in um, the the ABRSM um, choosing all the the pieces and stuff. And I think he has some links with them. He's he on his blog. He says. For God's sakes, why are people still doing this with, with trills and ornaments? Don't do this. So people have very strong feelings about this. Don't antagonise ABRSM examiners unnecessarily by doing these ornaments wrong. You know, having said all that, you've still got a lot of leeway with this. There's a lot that, that you can do. Um, you've got a lot of choice. But do the ornaments on the beat with trills from above. Um, so what I did when, when I was kind of cheating, like this, uh, the De Morden in bar five, um, and, and I did something like, uh, what, no, um, something like that. Because what you can do, what you can do on the inverse mordens is, um, um, and this is something that you were allowed to do in Baroque times. So, so bar one, now you can go, um, and I, I like playing them faster. But, but so it's basically G, F sharp, G. Uh, now you can cheat, you can cheat in a couple of ways. You can either play the G, hold on to the G, play the F sharp and let go. Um, now if you do this fast, it sounds, it sounds like you've done that. So, um, doesn't that sound? It's, it's indistinguishable from, from replaying the G and it's so much easier. So slowly is... But when you speed it up, it's... And, and why not? Why not do it that way? It's so much easier. Or there's another way that you can cheat and that's just to play them both at the same time, then let go of the F sharp. Now that might sound horrible, but if you speed it up, you, you can't tell the difference. Well, you can tell the difference a little bit. So I just play both together and then immediately let go of the F sharp. Why not? Why not do that? And then you get these, these beautiful, very crisp articulations without actually having to do the, the trills and the mordants and stuff. So, um, you know, try those. You don't have to do that. You, you can, you can do, sometimes you want to do this and sometimes you just want to go. Um, but it's a, it's a lovely little cheat, you know, and, and you were allowed to do it in Baroque times. I've basically, I'm doing something similar with, with, the, with this trill. Um, so no, hang on, so. And then, and then I do something like that. It's, I kind of wish I hadn't cheated in that way because I, I would go back and fix that in the recording. But, you know, um, I, I still think it, it kind of works okay. I, it doesn't jump out too much for me. But, um, yeah, anyway, so um, uh, there I will put in the uh, description to the video below, uh, I'm going to put a link 
to an amazing resource that basically tells you how to do all of these ornaments that you read here. Because I, a lot of the time, I do not recommend what ABRSM have said. In this entire book, when, it, when ABRSM are looking at ornaments and saying, this is what they recommend, do not trust them. Especially in the Haydn, by the way. Oh my God, what are they doing in the Haydn? But no, do not trust them. Um, the same goes for fingering, by the way. Um, do not trust the fingering that ABRSM give you. A lot of the time it's unnecessarily difficult and I've got my own fingering just absolutely through uh, this entire thing. Um, you know, it, again, if uh, I am available for teaching online and for people who would like better fingering and stuff, or ask your teacher, you know, for, for better uh, fingering, because I do not like ABRSM fingering at all, ever. Um, ABRSM fingering is all about keeping you in box shapes and then only moving when you have to, which means that you have to use a lot of your weaker finger, finger, uh, your weaker fingers, and it's not good for your phrasing. That's just my opinion. But um, yeah, anyway. So um, uh, there are yes, what uh, one thing that I really, really recommend because you want all of the the semi quavers really, really crisp. So um, there's a bit of a cheat that I do. Um, where is it? Um, so from bar. 25 no no okay that's it bar, bar 24 i have a little bit of a cheat in here so i'm going to go from bar 23 and i've just come to the end of bar 24 so from bar 24 um, um, now i'm in the last beat uh the last quaver uh no the last beat now here I'm coming over with my right hand, and now all of the semiquavers are being played by my right hand. And then... So th this is all right hand, which is so, so much easier than playing it with the left hand. That is horrible, that is absolutely horrible in the left hand. It's like, why, why make life unnecessarily hard for yourself? So basically, bar 23, as written, bar 24, second beat, third beat, fourth beat, right hand, right hand. And then the left hand is doing uh, these jumps. So it's not the right hand jumping over, it's the left hand jumping over and, and, and then the right hand doing all the semi-quavers. That is gonna make your life so much easier, honestly. Um, so where, where we got to? Um, end of bar 26. And now here, it's still the, le still the right hand doing the semi-quavers. And then it's just the right hand. The, the right hand just keeps on doing this this line. Now then when you get to bar 28, it's unnecessarily complicated and difficult to read. Get your Busoni edition out and it actually splits it into three staves here and just play it the way that Busoni recommended it. It's so much easier than the way that it's written down here. Um, so I've made a couple of sneaky changes that I need to kind of apologize for that, that you could or maybe don't need to do in your exam. Do this at your own peril. Now, I really liked, um, at the beginning of page four, so bar 17, I just felt absolutely compelled to move the left hand down an octave. Um, so it's just, uh, so if I come from um, the bar before, um, uh, what was it? And then rather than playing here, it sounds so weak. I way prefer. Um, I love that. It just sounds gorgeous. And I just couldn't help myself because Bach didn't write for a piano. He, he wrote for, you know, harpsichord or whatever other instruments were around in his time. If he'd had a piano, I have no doubt that, that he would have gone for that texture. And what was interesting is that well after I made this decision, um, I listened to a harpsichord playing it, and um, 
there was a particular version that I listened to where the harpsichord has octave doubling, and it actually does play it in this octave down there. And some harpsichords have doubled octaves. So, I, so I'm like, yeah, yeah, that actually, in, in many ways, that has an authenticity to it. So that's one change that I made. Um, there's another much more serious ch uh, change that I made in bar, where is it? Bar, um, I'm at bar 37, bar 20, uh, 38. Now, here we are. It's the last beat of bar 38. And what I've done is I've, um, that's how I learnt it originally. I learnt it. Now, um, I'm looking at the, um, the last beat, or the second from last quaver in the left hand of bar 38. And um, you have, uh, in the score, you've got uh, an E flat and a G, and then the C and an E flat. Now, the way that I learnt it from the Busoni version, Busoni changes this. In the Busoni version, it is an E, and, uh, an e flat and a G flat. Uh, and... Um, and then I saw, oh, that's not a G flat, it's a G natural. And I even checked in, the, in Bach's own manuscript, which I'll talk about in a minute if I have time. Um, so, and then I came back to this, and then for a long time I was like, mm, I wasn't sure. And then I went back to the Busoni version, and I tell you why, because I, I had a really strong listen to this. So what have you got? From halfway through bar 37, this is what's going on. We, we've got, whoops, we've got... Um, And then you've got this weird chord here, but you basically it's so, and then the pattern repeats, and then from bar 38, you've got this chord. Now here's the bit that I changed because here it's it, that just does not work for me because the, what, what's going on before? Whoops. It's like there's a, there's a dissonant and, and uh, dissonance and it resolves, and then it happens again, and then here, um, no, that doesn't do it for me. So what Brusoni do is he fixed the pattern so that the pattern stays the same. So um, you've got, oh, sorry, in bar 38, and then uh, sorry, that's bar 37. That's the the last beat of bar 37. And then in the second beat of bar 38, you've got... And then Busoni changed that G to a G flat so that it goes... And that just sounds, that sounds right to me. It sounds absolutely right. And I found that I just could not, I could not get it right. When I was playing a G, I just kept getting notes wrong. It just didn't, it didn't fit under my finger. So, um... Um, where are we? Bar 38. That just sounds right to me with the G flat as opposed to... It just doesn't sound right. It, 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 it's just not right to me. So, I anyway, so I changed that note back to the uh, G flat, which I'd learned originally from Busoni's version. And um, Busoni had a good ear for this stuff. Now, you might um, have noticed, well, or, or, or no, it depends how closely you've listened. There's a couple of places where I like adding additional ornaments. Um, I like, in particular, um, so I'm going to go from bar 15 um, towards the, the end of the first half. Um, uh, what, what, hang on, what have we got? Uh, okay. And I just like that little inverse modern at the end um, before. So yeah, a little bit rusty at the moment, sorry about that. Um, but, uh, and then the same at the end, so... And then, I, I love that little inverse modern. And, and, and the way that I described before, which is that I play the note, and then I play the note underneath while holding on to this, and then let go. So, um, yeah, I just really like that. I like it that you don't have to do that, um, um, but it's okay. You were expected to be able to improvise and you were expected to add your own ornamentation wherever you felt was tasteful and appropriate in Bach's time. And if you didn't do this, you were not considered to be a good musician. Um, 
So, yeah, by the way, it's really worth pointing out that, I mean, what a, what a time to be alive. Um, on the MSLP is Bach's own manuscript of this piece. You can look at it and see this piece in Bach's own handwriting. How amazing is that? Maybe I'm being a bit of a geek though, you know, but, but that is so exciting that, that you can look at his writing and feel like the character of what he wanted. You know, you see, I think it's so important to, to look at manuscripts, the, the original source, whenever you can. Um, although I've got to warn you, it's really difficult to read. The first time I looked at this, I was like, huh? All the notes are wrong. And then I, I worked out after like a, a 20 seconds, Oh, he's not using a treble clef. So you have to read the top line, not in the treble clef, but in the soprano clef, um, which means that basically in the treble clef where you read E, that is now middle C and you have to kind of shift everything. So that, that's a little bit um, annoying, you know, that, that you have to learn to read it in a new clef. But you can still look at it and sort of get an idea for it. And then if there's something that you don't quite trust in the... Um, in the uh, ABRSM version, you can literally look at the manuscript and go, well, what's Bach actually written here? And, and that is so exciting, you know, that, that's, that's great. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, uh, oh yes, I was gonna go through some of the other things that it says in this um, ridiculous teaching notes. Um, so, um, um, What's it say? It talks about pedaling. Oh my God, please, please don't follow their suggestions on pedaling. It, it says, um, discrete pedaling might effectively be applied to the descending arpeggio figures of the subject, like this. Now that is so exciting when you play with no pedal and, and you go, uh, you d and, and you know, if you go, no, no. Um, why? It's, it's so much more vibrant. It's got so much more life and energy and fire when you go. Uh, and Brussoni suggests staccato left hand. Sometimes, and near the end of the piece, I suggest so you can go. I like. Now, in the beginning, I prefer it staccato. Uh, um, and then maybe when you get to the end, you can then, you know, once you've done all this exciting stuff, you can then go. Yeah, I love that, you know. So, and it also suggests using the pedal in sort of moments like this. Um, now again here, why would you use the pedal? Um, I mean, that's great, sort of nice and staccato and sort of, uh, uh, and crisp. So with pedal, it then goes, no, oh, that's just so horrible, you know. Um, I urge you, especially if you're not used to playing Baroque music and you, you're used to just shoving pedal on everything, oh, just give it, give it a try without doing that. And then it suggests in other places, like I think it suggested it here. I mean, I love this with no pedal. You know, I, I love it with no pedal, and, and this suggests, it suggests... Please, please, no, please, oh god, no, that's just killing it, it's killing everything there is to love about that in, in that moment, in my opinion. You know, if you, were, if you were my student, and you really, really desperately wanted to do that, then, you know, half pedal it, or you know, but, but do it sparingly. But in my opinion, it just goes against good taste. Now, there's another thing that's worth bearing in mind. This piece requires super evenness of fingers. So um, the, the arpeggio is not too bad, but you must practice. So, so that's really hard to make that left hand even. If you're not careful, it just turns into, you know, especially three, four, five. Um, to have three, four, five nice and crisp and even is very, very hard. Um, so something that I suggest, this is my go-to way of fixing things that are uneven. Um, take these five notes and then do them with shifting accents 
where you go loud, quiet, loud, quiet, loud, quiet, loud, quiet, loud, quiet, in groups of two. One, two, 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 one, two. Now this is great for getting finger independence um, in your fourth and fifth finger. And for most people, it's when you do the accent on the fourth finger. So one, three, five, two, four. That's where the beauty of this is. And don't just go, it's gotta be loud, quiet, loud, quiet, loud. Really exaggerate this. Then do it in groups of three. One, two, three, one, two. And make sure you exaggerate the difference between loud and quiet. Then do it in groups of four. And then by the time you've done all that, um, in all the different permutations, you will have... And you'll have this beautiful even... Um, rather than... With, with, uh, which uh, a lot of people are just going to have an inevitable blurriness between, between fingers three, four, and five. Um, and there's loads of places through this piece where you will probably need to do that kind of practicing just to make everything nice and even. So, um, you know, in my opinion, play this piece with fire and love. Don't just be... And, and, and you know, not too much romanticism either. Um... That, that's just that's just not what this piece is in my opinion it's and then also like something that I like is um, and then short and then your hand comes up and really so up down Blah, 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 blah. Again, a little bit uneven. Uh, not practice, but anyway. So, um, there was something else that just jumped into my mind that I was going to cover. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's probably enough. That's another 40 minutes that I thought was only going to be a 10-minute tutorial. But, yeah, do look in the, um, the descriptions for links to various things that, that I've referred to. Um, there's so much more, so, so much more that I could talk about this piece. Um, but, uh, you know, like um, I'm probably going to say in all my other videos, I am available to teach online for, for anyone who's interested if I've whetted your appetite. Um, and uh, I hope you enjoy this piece. I absolutely love and adore this Bach. Um, yeah, and so basically have fun with it um, and um, uh, see you hopefully on other tutorials and do check out the rest of my videos. So, um, yeah, enjoy yourself.